Good evening. I'm Anne Flaherty and I'm delighted to be able to welcome you to the Irish Cultural Centre's Digital Literary Festival. The centre is based in Hammersmith, London, and for the past 25 years has delivered to its patrons the most diverse Irish cultural and educational programme outside Ireland. The festival comprises a series of interviews featuring some of the most successful authors in contemporary Irish writing. They will be discussing, and some of them will also be reading, from their recent publications. My interview this evening is with the award-winning author Liz Nugent and we'll be discussing her fourth book, Our Little Cruelties. I'd just like to say welcome to Liz, thank you so much for joining us and to get us started Liz is going to read a short extract from the beginning of the book. Thanks Anne, thank you so much and thank you for, to everybody who's tuning in. I'm just going to read a tiny bit, I'm not going to bore the heads off you, this is a, probably a minute of a reading. Um, from the very prologue of the book. All three of the drum brothers were at the funeral, although one of us was in a coffin. Three is an odd number, so there had always been two against one, although we all switched sides regularly. Nobody would ever have described us as close. As the service began, I became tearful. My living brother and I stood side by side at the top of the crematorium while people lied to us about what a brilliant man our brother had been. All the usual meaningless cliches. His death was sudden, horrific. The investigation was quick and conclusive. I was not a suspect. I had a sense of freedom and relief I hadn't felt in quite a while. I didn't expect that this air of serenity would last, but I thought I would enjoy it while I could. My surviving brother was unreadable to me. Maybe he was thinking of our brother's smashed and broken body. Still, even he must have known that this outcome was for the best. Daisy sat in the pew behind us. She seemed not to be aware of her surroundings, fidgeting and whispering to herself. I caught my brother's eye as her babbling became audible and people began to notice. He reached out and quietly asked her to join us. That reaching out of his hand made me shudder momentarily. She seemed to return to reality and move to stand between us without any argument. We both attempted to put a proprietorial arm around her shoulder, but she shrugged us off. We brothers looked at each other. The old rivalry resurfaced. That's Thank it. you, Liz. <laughs> Thank you very much. I defy anybody not to want to rush out and buy the book to find out what happened next. Um, uh, it's a cracker of an intro. And I know that um, you've been praised for your ability for what Graham Norton described as being able to grab readers by the scruff of the neck and drag them through a plot uh, by hooking them and keeping them hooked in. And that's a very rare quality, I think. And it, it certainly is a gift. Um, can you tell me, in, in, in deciding to write Our Little Cruelties, what, uh, what inspired you to write the book? How did it come about? Was it the plot or was it the character that came to you first? But it's really, it's always character first, but I think because the two previous books, like the first book I, I wrote, Unraveling Oliver, centred on a man, and then the two um, intervening ones, Lying in Wait and Skin Deep, both centred on women. And um, in, in each case, all of those characters had no siblings, whether by design or by nature, they were, you know, raised as only children. I thought, like, maybe I should look at sibling relationships. And um, because the two previous ones had been about women, I decided to write about uh, men. So I chose three brothers. Now, I have four brothers. And I have to say, they're nothing like <laughs> the characters in this book they're actually nice and normal whereas um these characters are either troubled or deeply deeply flawed they are indeed it's true and uh, one of the devices that you use in the book is to actually tell the story uh, from the perspective of each of those three characters um so uh you know the, the three brothers i suppose we should give them names there's the eldest brother will and then there's brian who's in the middle and then there's luke who's the youngest and the uh the story follows their 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 
it's, it's, it spans about 40 or 50 years, doesn't it? Yeah. So it takes them from their childhood up to their middle age and their rivalries and their betrayals and the jostling for position in the family. And I suppose at the end of the day, what it, what it seemed to me was that they were very much looking for their mother's approval. And she herself is quite a, a, a character, isn't she? She's quite a controversial character. So it's very much a family, uh, dysfunctional family drama, isn't it? Very much so. I mean, the, that setup that I read at the beginning, to, it raises so many questions. And you, uh, you like, does, does the why, why is, why is one of the brothers in the coffin? Which brother is in the coffin? And which brother put him there? You know, that's that's the set. Those are the three central questions that you get from that prologue. So then I go through each brother's life from early childhood to kind of late 40s, early 50s. So really the span of my own life. I'm 52, so I'm slightly older than than Will, who's the oldest character in the book. So um, and and they're growing up. Um, will they, 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 they each get treated very differently by their mother. And I think that's the key to how they progress and live out their lives as adults. Will, for example, is his mother's golden boy. You know, he cannot do anything wrong. He um, is uh, very much um, favored by the mother. He is, um, I mean, she just idolizes him. He can do no wrong. And because of that, he grows up with this sense of entitlement and privilege that he deserves all the good things that come to him. And if he doesn't deserve them, he'll just take them, you know, and that includes his brother's girlfriend. You know, there's like, there's nothing that he doesn't feel that he should have. So um, he will just take, take, take as much as he can. Mm. And then Brian's attitude to his mother, he's kind of um, relegated. She doesn't really notice him that much. So he, he's, you know, he's kind of stuck in the middle. And then Luke um, is really despised by his mother. And when Luke achieves, um, um, I should say that the mother is a, an actress who kind of in the, the later years of the book, her celebrity is fading. You know, she was a show band singer. She was of that era. And then, you know, as her celebrity begins to fade, her youngest son, who she really despises and never gives a chance to and the reasons for that are explained at the very end of the book but um she um she has an insane jealousy of her youngest son then because he achieves a kind of celebrity that she never did mm -hmm. when you say that the, uh, the books are usually a uh, character driven or the characters come first which of those characters did you find most difficult to write was there one that you actively disliked or did you try to, to um, you know, or did you have sympathy, say, for any of them? Well, I, I obviously would have more sympathy for Luke because he mm. suffers from mental health issues. Mm. Um, but I kind of, I, I know it sounds awful because Will, Will is awful and, and uh, Brian is awful. And Luke is awful as a, in his own way because even though he suffers from mental health issues, he is incredibly selfish. It's all about Luke at the end of the day when I'm talking about them all, when mm. I'm writing them, I get into their character in my head. So I quite like them when I'm writing them. It's only when I step back afterwards and I think, oh my God, these are awful people. But when I am them, when I when I physically, well, not physically, but metaphorically put myself into their headspace and I write the books, they all justify their own actions. They all, you know, they all have valid reasons for behaving the way they do. And they feel you know, um, provoked or they feel justified or they feel entitled or they feel they will all have some reason for behaving that the way they do. Well, they're also quite good at blaming other people for their own problems. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 The blame game is strong. Usually each other. Well, I think in that case, because you're dealing with very complex characters and a complex situation, the whole idea of each 
person narrating their story is very valuable for the reader because then it gives the reader a different perspective but it also allows the reader to make up their own mind which one do, do is there one that they like is there one that they dislike even more than the others or are they all mean basically yeah well i think i think will uh, from the reader so far everybody kind of hates will because <laughs> he's so misogynistic and entitled mm. and privileged i mean he's the essence of the privileged white man and they have a certain sympathy for brian up until they get to brian's um chapters because then they realize that brian's motivations are not as pure because brian is the one who rescues luke a lot and uh, minds Luke more than Will. Will has pretty much no time for Will. He just sees him as a loser and a failure. And um, he's kind of jealous of his pop career in the beginning, but um, uh, then wants to use it for his own ends. But then when Luke falls from grace to drug addiction and mental health breakdowns and psychotic episodes, it's always Brian who picks up the pieces. So naturally the reader thinks until they get to Brian's chapter, that Brian must be the nice guy of the family. And then they read Brian and they find out that he's actually not so nice after all. Well, let's talk about the women in the book then for, for a start. Um, sure. Now, I know you said somewhere that you uh, focus on male characters because they're easier to write and women overthink everything. Yes. Is that true? Yeah, yeah I think um, men are like I found with Unraveling Oliver and, and with this book that it was much easier to write male characters because they say what they think. Um, uh, women do tend to second guess themselves and to doubt themselves and they're less confident and less straightforward in the way they um, think about themselves and about the world and their place in the world. So, um, you know, for example, I think when I met my husband and I was really mad about him and I, I kind of said to him, we met in New York and I said to him, you know, he was leaving New York and I was going to be back in Ireland, um, you know, a couple of days later. And I took up the courage and I just said to him, you know, I'd, I'd really like to see you when we get back to Ireland. And he said, yeah, well, that goes without saying. And I had to ring about a hundred friends and say, what does he mean? What does he mean? What does he mean by that goes without saying? Does that mean that he wants to see me? Does that mean, you know, and it was crazy because he meant what he said. That goes without saying. He meant that, yes, I agree with you. But uh, um, at the time I, I was, you know, I was so full of self-doubt and so full of um, angst and lust and all of those things that go with the young love that you know I, I just I couldn't quite trust myself that what he was saying was true and I just thought mm, he'll he'll disappear now he'll he'll just vanish and I won't see him again but I did well he didn't <laughs> he's still around <laughs> so he certainly did but getting back to the women in the book, there's there's the mother um, who is, as you say, the uh, the failing, her career is failing. She's getting older, although she does have a brief revival at the end and her troubled relationship with her sons. But then there are the other uh, women. Uh, there's Will's wife, Susan, who, oh, I better not give too much away. But anyway, there's Will's wife, Susan, who who is sort of a, in some ways a victim of of his bad behavior in every way a victim of his bad behavior and there's their daughter Daisy um, and the, when when you talked about um, uh, the uh, the fact that uh, the growth of feminism the, the person that resonated with me in terms of that statement was Mary because she starts off as Will's assistant he treats her very badly but yeah. hooray she breaks away and yeah. does very well for herself yes uh, so uh, and Susan, to give her a due, does get involved in in um, feminist campaigning and social justice issues. Campaigning and social justice issues. Yeah. So she does find, you know, some. I know well, I can't go into too much about what happens, but uh, you know, they do. Ha there is a journey. It's not yeah. always. Uh, yeah. Uh, they do. The women. Think. The women all develop to a certain extent. The the women all develop and change, and the men don't. The men stay the same. Pretty much like each character, apart from the dead one who's dead, <laughs> the other two, the other uh, two brothers are pretty much at the end of the book, the same as how they are when they started. The old rivalry resurfaces, 
you know yes. they they are back to being um enemies yes and whereas the women uh, change and evolve daisy you know it is more or less destroyed by the actions of her parents um and her uncle um and uh sh she ends up as damaged as luke does in the end um um and that's not really giving too much away because it's a different kind of damage um mm. uh and uh mary yes mary learns a lot from working with will and she walks away from that experience saying that will never happen to me again i will never accept that behavior again mm -hmm. and even though that's not kind of written in the book you f you find her towards the end of the book that she's an incredibly strong character and that she has been has become incredibly successful at what she does that she is now will's competitor and he is absolutely furious at this that this you know he thinks she should be making coffee for the boss you know um he's so dismissive of her and it it all ties back to an event that happened many years before at the Cannes Film Festival that's detailed in the book. Mm. As you say, um, at the end of the book, the the uh, the, the rivalry resumes. The, it's always been two against one. It just moves around which two are against which one, which in terms of the brothers. Uh, and they've never really severed the cord with their childhood, have they? They yeah. haven't grown at all. Um, and for Daisy, as you say, the sad thing is that the, the mental illnesses then pass passes on to the next generation. But um, I wondered if if you were making some comment on the nature versus nurture debate in your treatment of the mother and her relationship with the sons. Well, yeah, I mean, the mother is a product of her own upbringing as well, which mm. doesn't really get revealed until the end. Mm. Um, um she like her background was never easy either and um, she married for status rather than love she had three children literally one after the other in fact one i think is 11 months that luke is 11 months after the birth of brian so um her her and because of experiences that she has in her life um, around fame and then um, sexual assault at, at a, in a kind of seminal scene in, in, in the novel. Um, she becomes, um, she's, she's sort of unhinged herself and her own mother, her own mother's history uh, comes into the book as well. So we find out, for, first of all, um, I think it's clear from earlier on that, um, that that the mother was adopted. So um, the boys don't know too much about her history, but at the end we find out a little bit more about her history and her past. And it does explain why she is as damaged as she is and why she is as flawed as she is. So I, I always do look at every character, at their backgrounds, even the really monstrous ones, to explain, you know, because people, I, I don't think monsters are born that way. I think they are made. And, um, but I kind of leave it up to the reader to make that decision. But, you know, show me, show me a serial killer who had a happy childhood. Mm. It just don't exist. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, mm -hmm. you know, the, that damage, that, that will to hurt people, that um, psychopathy, uh, generally, um, is it does it doesn't manifest itself out of nowhere. Mm. How do you sort of research um, your books, particularly the psychological element? I don't. You don't. I, I, no, I don't. Uh, and the reason why is um, I get away with it by not naming the um, the particular psychological because you know I think. Um, at one stage, Luke says, oh, I'm bipolar or schizophrenic or manic depressive or whatever they're calling it this week, because these names change, you know, these conditions change over time, you know, and, you know, he's, he's, he, you know, the, the, the terms for people 
are constantly changing. And over the course of his life, he's he's diagnosed and named and uh, I, I felt that way with Luke. And plus, because I have no background in psychotherapy or psychoanalysis, I don't want to pin a label on them that some psychiatrist can come back at me and say that's completely, you know, not how this character would work. I just write the characters the way I see them. And in every single one of my books, there is somebody who somebody else describes like usually the, the editors might might say something about, you know, the, the sociopath or the psychopath, or whatever. But I don't label them as such because I don't know enough about um psychiatric issues to be able to do that. Now I did in the very beginning I did write write to a psychiatrist friend of mine and I said, what is the difference between a psychopath and a sociopath? And he sent me reams of papers, reams of literature on both conditions and uh, there was so much conflict in the papers that I read between different psychiatrists that it was very hard to differentiate from one to the other so I actually never use the terms in the book I just write the characters the way that I write them now there's no doubt that uh, Luke suffers from psychotic episodes and I know somebody who has suffered from psychotic episodes in a similar way to Luke and he's thankfully very well now I mean he seems to have made a full recovery but he's always he lives in fear that that will come back again and I think that's Luke's uh, overriding fear as well that mm. you know that mm. you know that he'll never be completely safe he'll never be completely well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What sort of uh, target audience do you have Liz? Do you know who your audience are? What, what, who are your readers? Do you know? Well it's funny I, I'm, I'm very lucky in that I seem to have I've caught the sort of the crime readers, I've caught the literary readers you know um, Sebastian Barry has praised my books really highly so has Donald Ryan mm -hmm. um, so has Marion Joseph O'Connor Joseph O'Connor uh, love Joseph O'Connor and um, uh, Marion Keys, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm sort of, I, 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 I've, there's something about these characters that appeals to people and I think it's the fact that, um, particularly in this book, it's families, you know, it's yes. a functional family and as Irish people generally, um, prior to whenever it was 1980, was it 1988 when contraception was legalized? We all came from big families. You know, so we all have that kind of, we all have siblings and we all have rivalries and we all have, we all know what it's like, generally speaking, those of us of a certain age, what it's like to grow up in a big family and to have mm. that, you know, but I, I take it to a very extreme level in this book. Mm -hmm. Yes, and as Tolstoy said, happy families are all alike, but each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. <laughs> That's right. And I think you're right. Uh, uh, Irish uh, re readers particularly would would um, relate to to um, a lot of your stories, um, a lot of the relationship uh, dynamics in your stories. Um, I wondered uh, about your own journey as a writer, because uh, this is your fourth. <clears throat> this is your fourth novel and you had great success with Unraveling Oliver, which was your, your first su successful commercial publication. How did you start writing and tell us a bit about your journey to where you are now? Um, well, I wrote the first chapter of Unraveling Oliver was a standalone short story that I entered into Ortiz, Francis, Francis McManus short story award competition and it got shortlisted, but it didn't get placed. It didn't come anywhere and I'm not bitter about that at all. But um, it uh, the story kind of wouldn't leave me alone because in it I had mentioned a couple of other characters and it's a man coming home and the first line is um uh what is the first line uh I did um, oh. it was about hitting her I didn't yeah. it's like the, I uh, I expected more of a reaction the first time I hit her this yes. is the first line and I just thought that was that was a killer first line that mm -hmm. you know I could go forward with that and then I wrote a whole chapter um, about this man who has just beaten his wife to a pulp and he goes off for a drink 
and then he comes home and we realize as he's talking that you know he's not he's not what you expect of a man who beats his wife and goes off to a pub you know um usually you know that kind of person is stereotypically wearing a wife beater vest and you know is a working class thug and this instead was a very respectable very wealthy um uh, charismatic very charismatic very popular writer of children's fiction and um sort of an irish jk rowling if you like um so i i um i we had mentioned a couple of people in that story, some peripheral characters, and that character of Oliver wouldn't really leave me alone. So I continued after, you know, the competition was over and everything. I started wondering, well, why did he, like at the end of that story, it's not resolved as to why he hit her. He does say she provoked me, but we don't, like, what could she possibly have done? Like, there's no justification for what he did. And I decided to write the story of all of the events that led up to him beating her and um, that go back to his earliest childhood and even to before his birth mm -hmm. that led to this moment of this catastrophic thing where this middle-aged man in his early 60s beats his wife into a coma never having laid a finger on her before and how does this how does this happen in a marriage that is seemingly to the outside world very happy and very content so i i filled in the gaps so oliver tells his story but also the people in his world who think that they know him like old school friends old university friends uh, an old employer who who employed him when he was a student working in a vineyard um his half brother who he doesn't really know um his old next door neighbor um and all, all of these all of these um other characters get to tell their impression of oliver and how he came to be and i suppose that's that was the way that story unfolded um gradually and then i kind of sat on it for a couple of months and i didn't send it to anybody i just kind of thought okay i've written it now i i i, I, ju I just was so nervous about what the reaction would be if I submitted it to a publisher and I just I, I just felt you know they're just gonna laugh at me you know I didn't think that I would be taken seriously uh, and then that's the soft out of, of an Irish woman I think you know that kind of lack of confidence and I just I, 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 I did nothing for three months and then I had sent it to my oldest brother again looking to him a man for for validation i sent it to my oldest brother to uh read and he came back and he said you know the, you know i think you should send that off i think it's quite good so quite good he said and so i sent it off to um a couple of agents and they came back um I think three out of the six of them came back and offered to represent me straight away. And I chose Marianne Gunn O'Connor because she uh, represented a couple of friends of mine who were writers. So um, I knew that she was trustworthy and they all adored her. So um, I went with her and then she uh, put it out in submission. And I thought, this is fantastic. Like the book is gonna be published. And then the rejections started coming in one by one and after the 19th rejection i just said to her like just don't tell me anymore until you get an acceptance somewhere like i'd, I'd just rather not know but i did i was um not cocky but i was at that stage confident enough to know that it would be published i really think it did because the rejections that came in were usually from um an editor saying look i loved it I bought it to my marketing department, I bought it to an acquisitions meeting and, you know, the editors all loved it, but the marketing people don't know where to put it because it doesn't quite fit mm. into mm. 
crime and it's not yeah. kind of high concept enough to be literary even though it's well written and they just didn't know what box to put it in so that was the kind of rejections I was getting and then my favorite rejection was that it was too disturbing and when, when I got that one I thought then I knew and then I knew it's got, it's definitely going to be published if it's too disturbing because they published American Psycho which I think is the most horrific book ever <laughs> sorry to all the Brad Easton ass fans out there but I, I you know I threw that book in the bin and it's like Unraveling Oliver isn't remotely as disturbing as that none of my books are remotely as disturbing as that I don't go into um, incest or sexual violence or you know I steer I give those subjects quite a wide berth it's it's really about psycholo psych the psychological damage that families in particular can do to each other mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I kind of I had that confidence that it was going to be published and then eventually Penguin Ireland came on board and said yes they would publish it and um, it uh, I then had to rewrite the end I think four times before um, they were happy with it and then and then it got published and um, it quickly caught on in Ireland I think in, in the first I think it got to number one in the first two or three months and I couldn't believe it. I was kind of shocked because I just kind of thought, oh, you write a book and it gets published and you see it on a shelf in a library or, or a bookshelf and you're delighted with yourself and the end and then you go back to your job. And, you know, that's how it works. You so hadn't thought of yourself as being a writer with, you know, the pressure to now come up with book number two. Yeah. Yeah, well, that was the shocker, actually, because mm. after that, that, that book then won Crime Novel of the Year Award. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I was put into that category. That was the first time I, I, I realised I was a crime novelist because I, I didn't write with genre in my head at all when I, when I um, was writing. I didn't think at all of, of what genre. I just wrote the story that was in me story that was me that had to come out story so, that was burning inside you you weren't yeah you weren't thinking commercially that's what they're they're paid to do yeah uh, you were looking at the creative process and um and all of your books have shot up the charts and and you have a very loyal legion of fans now uh, eagerly awaiting your next book um i just wondered uh, about the influences in your in your on your own writing uh uh, what what writers do you admire? Who do you take inspiration from? Well, I I, I read uh, quite broadly, so I'm I'm not a genre snob. You know, mm -hmm. I I read, um, I read classics. I, you know, I'm just looking at my bookshelves over there. There's Dickens and Thomas Hardy and the Brontes, and um, there is Jan Carson from the north. Oh yes, we interviewed her at the uh, at the Irish. Yes. I interviewed her at the Irish Centre last October. Yeah. She's mm. fantastic. And there's mm. Donal Ryan, yes, Andrea yeah. Carter, um, and I'm, I'm just throwing out Irish names now. Nisha Dolan, who's a new oh, yes. writer, is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, I love Sebastian Barry. I love Anne Enright. I love um, Marion Keyes. I love Claudia Carroll. I love Rachel English. Um, uh, I, I like crime, romantic fiction. Um, I've just recently actually read. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be the craziest about kind of fantasy stuff, but I read the most hilarious novel by Owen Caulfield for adults called High Fire, about a dragon who lives down in the bayou in New Orleans, who uh, has a fondness for Jack Daniels and a serious, um, uh, a serious. Um, uh, dislike of how dragons were portrayed in Game of Thrones. It's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> it just it made me laugh so much. I haven't read a book that made me laugh so much in a long, long time. So um yeah, I I read pretty much very broadly. Yeah, yeah very broadly. And I I, th I think, you know, that's 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 probably why I have a broad audience. Because if you read broadly, then you write broadly and then your your readers come from everywhere. Um so yeah, I think read everything that you can get your read hand everything, on. yeah, yeah. And, and then find your own voice. Yeah, yeah. And how about uh, your, you know, your experience during the lockdown? I think you, 
you had a tough time. I mean, having delivered the book and, and the euphoria of that, I think you, you then took a bit of a tumble, didn't you? And yeah. ended up in hospital. Yes, I was, I, I, I fell and dislocated my kneecap. And um, for a normal person, that would be, you know, six weeks in a plaster cast on crutches, maybe even four weeks in a plaster cast on crutches, and then you'd be fine. But I have an underlying um, condition because of a brain hemorrhage I had when I was a child called dystonia. And it's um, there's very little known about it, really. Um, but because of that condition, it meant that my entire right leg went into extreme spasm. So I ended up in, in hospital for like the accident happened. I, I tripped, I was a, in a friend's, I was actually in uh, Michael O'Loughlin, the poet's house uh, for brunch with him and his lovely wife, Judith. And um, I, uh, before I even got in the door, I tripped on the deck outside their um, apartment and um, dislocated my kneecap, broke my tibia, and patella but um because of the dystonia I, I couldn't have surgery i i was not a candidate for surgery because it would cause um so many more problems because of the prior brain hemorrhage <clears throat> so i was 12 weeks in hospital i was six weeks in st vincent's and then another six weeks in the royal hospital uh, in donnybrook getting rehab and i came out of there um, I was very, very heavily medicated for, you know, the, certainly the first six weeks and I'm still still on quite a lot of medication now, more than, um, you know, what, what I'm on now would knock you out, would send you to sleep. But, um, you know, you do get used to medication, although it's kind of a dangerous road as well because you do get addicted to medication. I'm probably addicted to a lot of things, but until my leg gets better I am just going to stay with the drugs because they work and um, so um so how was um, the lockdown for you then the lockdown was uh well I only really just really got out of hospital yeah. I was you know I, I was only out a couple of weeks when the lockdown happened um so and I was I, I was um on crutches so I couldn't really go anywhere or do anything anyway so mm. you know and um I, I don't miss pubs particularly. Um, I missed seeing my friends. I missed, you know, socializing, obviously. Um, but um, I didn't, my husband ended up doing all of the supermarket shopping. And I did, I did a lot of the cooking and whatever. But, you know, it was only towards the end, end of the lockdown that I began to be able to write again. So um, I wrote uh, the first draft of a play while, while lockdown was happening. And um, I don't know what's going to happen with that now because there's so much uncertainty about when or how theatres are mm -hmm. ever going to reopen um, until, you know, there's a universal vaccine. So, um, uh, yeah, that's... Can you tell us a bit about, about that? Because that's a new venture for you. I know, yeah. I know you did work in the theatre. Yeah, I, I, I spent 15 years working in theatre as a stage manager, so I kind of felt, oh, yeah, of course I can write a play. And I then I went to write the play, and it was like, oh, my God, this is a whole different ball game. You know, you, it's not just text. You have to choose stage directions. And, you know, you don't want to hand over a radio play where it's just dialogue and dialogue and dialogue. You need to introduce as much visual instant as possible so that, you know, so that the audience has something to look at as well as a story to listen to. Mm. So, um uh, yeah. Who asked but, you to write the play? How did that come about? Uh, Landmark <laughs> Theatre Company and Clark from Landmark Theatre Company, who's probably one of the success, most successful mm -hmm. Irish theatre producers. She's just incredible and she brings shows to New York and London and, you know, she's immensely successful in this world. But um, I just, uh, you know, my heart goes out to her now because every single show she mm -hmm. had Mm. has been shelved or put on ice mm. um, so indeed and the same here in in the west end yeah it's a really tough tough time for her. so mm. um uh I, but I, when they come back yeah your play will hopefully be 
Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Ready for but, her. But I think she was surprised when um, I gave her the play because she was expecting. I, I said, you know, what, what kind of play do you want? And she said, you have a free hand. You can do whatever you want, write whatever kind of play you want. And I said, OK. And I think she thought she was going to get something dark and sinister like the books. But I handed her a comedy script. What because, comedy? Yeah, because I have always wanted to write comedy like it's always been a, an itch that needs to be scratched in me um because like in in my daily my books are really dark but in my daily life um i like to have a laugh you know and you know my friends are all funny people and you know i like to make them laugh so um yeah i wrote this madcap not quite a farce but it's sort of a comedy drama with a bit of darkness in it, obviously, but uh, yeah, it's 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 a it's a it's a funny play, um. So um, yeah, I think she was quite surprised at that. No, so. that would be that would that would be very interesting, um, for everyone to see. Um, I know that your books are very popular with book groups, and I don't know if you were ever in one yourself, but I do remember reading somewhere that you you hosted literary salons. Yeah, well, I did. Yeah, I did one um, in um, Michelle uh, Stevenson's house. Um, she was doing a fundraiser, and uh, she asked me, "Would I host this?" So we just gathered. I think I think there was about sixty or seventy people turned up, and she made like a, a massive bowl of like stew or some kind of pie or whatever and there was oceans of wine and I uh, had a couple of writers lined up including myself to read and and talk about our books and answer questions about our books and uh, so yeah that was that was great fun and we raised a, a lot of money for charity so that was fun and I've also um, curated literary festivals where I you know organized writers to come down to uh, Skibbereen Arts Festival mm -hmm. and I've interviewed lots of writers so I've interviewed Joseph O'Connor um, on stage in the Pavilion Theatre after his last wonderful book his name is Shadow Play mm -hmm. um, about the Bram Stoker story and I've interviewed Jane Harper the Australian writer mm -hmm. who wrote um, The Dry and I've interviewed Sinead Gleeson, who wrote the incredibly brilliant Constellations. And I've interviewed Jane Casey, an Irish author based in London. I'm sure you've come across her crime novels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, I've done a lot of interviewing in my time. And I am, I think next year I will be interviewing uh, possibly Graham Norton about his book. And I will be interviewing Professor Mary Cassidy the state pathologist here. Oh, about, very um, interesting. Yeah. So yeah, lots of, lots of, uh, lots of, you know, I interview people who write lots of different genres, but when I interview people, I always, you know, I'm very, you know, careful in my research and like you, you've done your homework, but I always make sure I read the book twice and that I'm very solidly prepared and, you know, you take it seriously. And um, because a writer can tell when the interviewer hasn't read the book and I have been interviewed several times by people who haven't read the book and it's so obvious to the writer it's not always obvious to the audience but I you know I I, I forgive that too because especially with radio presenters for example they don't have time to read every book that comes in through their door so they get briefing notes by their researchers who have read the book hopefully um, and so they'll they'll have a, a list of questions that they ask you, and you can just riff off that. So you know, mm -hmm. um, being being interviewed is a lot easier than being the interviewer. The interviewee has a much easier time. So thank you, Anne. Your job is much <laughs> tougher than mine. Well, you have made it very easy, uh, Liz. And thank you so much for coming. I think we can we can probably end on that note. And um, one thing I just wanted to say to our listeners was that if they want to purchase Our Little Cruelties, uh, if they would like to follow the link on the Irish Cultural Centre website, thank you, very good, um, it will be available, it's published by Penguin. It is uh, what Gay Byrne used to call a thumping good read. It's a really, really, really good good book and we're so looking forward to maybe having you in person one day over here in London. Hopefully. Uh, with 
your next book or your play or just come along, whatever. And uh, thanks again for joining Thank us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, good luck to everybody in London. Keep your distance, wash your hands, wear your face masks and stay safe.